And, um, and let me officially welcome um, you to our session and the potential mistrust in uh, technology. And uh, I hope we uh, will have an uh, inspiring 45 minutes to explore this topic. And uh, given uh, all the different backgrounds of uh, you as panelists, uh, no doubt we will explore many different angles. Uh, my name is Annette Nijs, and as you have seen from the program, uh, I'm a former cabinet minister of uh, education, science and culture in my country, the Netherlands. Uh, but nowadays I'm the president of uh, Business School Netherlands and the founder of the China uh, Agenda, which provides China interpretation, insights and introductions to Chinese business and political leaders. Mm -hmm. Now, as we feel all around us, um, more and more people feel uncomfortable with the power of technology in the hands of companies or governments who may be tempted to misuse it or the data generated uh, by it. And technology is uh, also at the heart of uh, many discussions between countries in the West and the East. And for myself, as a China expert, I wouldn't mind to hear from the panel about how we can prevent a technology divide or worse. And no doubt you will give us some uh, thought-provoking provoking reflections on this. We have 45 minutes um, and we are from all over the world in our panel, eh, from the US, China, India, UK. I will invite you one by one and then you have um, the time, two minutes or so, to uh, make a statement. And if we all um, adhere to that, we will have 30 minutes or so for, um, for discussion. Um, let me introduce uh, Leticia. Leticia carried uh, the Sayeux. find it difficult to pronounce. If it's not correct, please um, tell me, uh, Leticia. Um, you are the co-founder and CEO of Global Space Ventures. But in addition of being a tech entrepreneur and investor, you're also a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and write about foreign affairs and national security. And I know that you have identified tech diplomacy as a new imperative. And I would suggest, uh, Leticia, to take the floor. Thank you very much, Annette, and great to be with you all today. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll take that cap, that uh, foreign affair cap, since uh, we have on the panel, uh, you know, some, uh, some great entrepreneurs who I think will talk to other specific sectors and industry. And I'll share with you what worries me and also what gives me hope uh, when it comes to trust and technology and the misuses of technology. Uh, from my perspective, what's at stake really falls into three key buckets. Uh, one is our national security. Another big bucket is human rights, which transcend countries and political system. And a third one is liberal values. And this one is not as widely shared, but I think it's important to set the stage. Uh, you were mentioning China. I think really having an understanding of what matters on all sides is really critical. And there is also a mounting recognition that it will be a tricky balancing act to defend national security while promoting uh, innovative capacity, which I'm sure we'll get into. So for now I'll mention four of the chief concerns that we see here in the US to set the stage. The first is cyber attacks like SolarWinds and the Microsoft Exchange hack that we've had here in the U.S., but I know others, you know, are also prone to those cyber attacks. Uh, the second is disinformation on social media, which is a direct threat to the functioning of our democracies. A third issue that receives a lot of attention here in the U.S. is the rise uh, in digital authoritarianism in certain parts of the world. And finally, there's strong bipartisan consensus that our technologies should not facilitate military buildup by potential adversaries or human rights abuses. And so those are all the things that are uh, deeply concerning uh, from, I would say, a, a U.S. perspective and, and allies of the U.S. Uh, and as to the approach we should take uh, and what we can hopefully do to build a brighter future Together, uh, I'd like to share an example of what gives me hope uh, to go on a more positive note. 
uh, and share that, you know, it was great to see last week the Quad taking steps to become a central vehicle for cooperation around technology. Uh, we saw the U.S., Japan, Australia, India come together, launch a new cyber working group to counter the cyber attacks. Uh, we also saw that same group launch a working group on emerging technologies to help set standards in key technologies like 5G and artificial intelligence. And we know Europe is also very keen to increase the transatlantic dialogue on technology. And that all gives me great hope because if there is one key takeaway for me is that it's going to take a multilateral approach uh, to solve this issue of trust and technology. And it's an area where we're going to be stronger working alongside like-minded nations. Thank you, uh, Leticia. And um I'm glad that we um, ended in um, in some uh, hope uh, because uh, the last thing we want is that technology which is good for the world uh, will divide us. Uh, let me um, go to uh, Mohit. Uh, Mohit Joshi, you're the president of uh, Infosys in the UK and you have spent more than 20 years at uh, Infosys and a global leader of next generation digital <coughs> and services and you deal with tech all day uh, in addition you serve as a non-executive director at Aviva an international savings retirement and insurance business and no doubt your tech expertise there will be greatly appreciated <coughs> enlighten us from where you are standing uh, on today's topic of mistrust and technology sure and, I, and thank you and thank you all it's uh, great to be here so I'll just make a few sort of uh, brief comments about the opportunities and the challenges from a technology perspective. And uh, I'll try and encapsulate them or correlate them largely to the financial services business. Uh, I think a lot of these concerns come from the extensive use that we're seeing of artificial intelligence and machine learning within the industry. And these are very significant, right? Because these really have the opportunity to transform the industry from a cost perspective as we know, if you run a very expensive financial services business, it's a huge tax on the consumers. And equally, we want, uh, you know, we want financial services to be ubiquitous. We want them almost to be embedded in our day-to-day -day life. And it's very hard to do this without the use of AI and machine learning. Uh, when we say AI and machine learning, I'm obviously referring to the fact that we're looking to develop almost human-like capabilities uh, that our machines can provide. We're also looking to see the huge amounts of data that machines can process to drive our decision making. And especially within financial services, there are three uh, broad, I think, areas where AI and machine learning can be applied. I think the first has to do with customer operations. So, you know, whether it's the use of chatbots or more efficient contact centers or the hyper personalization imperative that we see in the industry, uh, consumers will be among the first uh, sort of users and beneficiaries of advanced AI and ML techniques. I think the second has to do with the core product engines of the financial institutions, whether it's a retirement product or a lending product or a savings product. The ability to really tailor this on a bespoke basis to launch new products will again benefit from AI and ML. And finally, it is the analytics and the warehouse capabilities of the organizations. The ability to really build more sophisticated models over time, which will also benefit from technology, but obviously there are huge concerns. People are very uncomfortable with the idea that, uh, you know, that they may be denied a loan or that, uh, you know, a, a repossession order may be made against them. Uh, and they're worried about uh, the you know, AI and machine learning really having an adverse impact on their life. And so we've been working with clients, advising them to create an overall uh, charter of ethics and a charter of governance where the use of AI is concerned so that it diminishes, it diminishes uh, people's concerns about the widespread use of these technologies. And in particular, we're asking them to look at the issues of bias, of explainability, of control and privacy, which you know, I will uh, try and address if it comes to it in the conversation. But this is broadly the opportunity and the challenge from an AI perspective. Um, thank you, um, uh, Mohit. And uh, maybe we can um, talk later a little bit more about this uh, charter of uh, ethics uh, or, or governance. Um, Liz, Liz O'Day, you are a biotech and a digital health uh, investor. 
And I think as the chief uh, executive offer, officer and founder of Olaris, a drug discovery company, you develop precision medicines for very devastating diseases. But you also contribute to Scientific American, and we all know this popular science and tech uh, magazine, as a member of its steering committee for top 10 technologies. Give us your take. Yeah, this is quite, quite an interesting topic. So first of all, thank you again for having me and for uh, joining this amazing group of panelists. You know, um, I'm going to approach it from the biotech angle. And, you know, we're living in such an amazing time where the clip at which we are able to take technology solutions developed in a lab and bring them out to the real world is ever increasing. And what this does lead to is amazing opportunities, right? Like the COVID vaccine being able to be developed in about a year's time, you know, that would not have been possible previously without the innovation of the tools that we have, as well as like our ability to capture, analyze, and mine data. Um, so there's a lot of great opportunity that like biotech or tech sort of brings here. But because it's happening so fast, I think sometimes people are having to react to it um, and that, that inherently there's a little bit of like mistrust. And then that, that creates a, a serious risk that the benefits of some of these technologies won't be fully embraced, right? You know, again, COVID vaccine as a great example. So how do we make sure that the tech that's coming out of biotech, you know, is vetted and people can kind of have faith in it? Um, you know, this is something that I think a lot about and we, we write about it at Scientific America. I'm also the co-chair at the World Economic Forum for the Biotech Council. And this is like every single one of our conversations kind of fo focuses on this. And, you know, what, what I've kind of come to believe is that you can't ask people to trust technology. Like to me, trust is like love, right? Like you can't force function that to happen. So what you can do and, and, and I think some of the other panelists started to kind of build in this is. Um, we can ask technology companies to display trustworthiness, right? And to me, that involves engaging the stakeholders in the dialogue, even in the co-creation of some of these technologies, making sure that we're showing sort of, you know, respect for cultural context, not saying everything that like works in, you know, high income companies has to work in our high income um, uh, countries has to work in low and, and middle income countries, you know, but really taking the time to kind of understand the individual nuances and then being transparent about how that data is going to work. Um, and it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I think this charter that you're talking about is something that we've been talking about on the biotech side of like, could we build like a scorecard, you know, that has, you know, some baseline level of, I don't want to call it trustworthiness, but like good principles, you're, you know, you're, you're not being nefarious and how you're using data and, you know, things like that, that people could look at and say like, okay, at least they got that like check mark and maybe we have, you know, different ranks and different tiers. Um, but also as, as, as something what Leticia said as well also resonates with me, what we're thinking about in the biotech world is you can't just have trust in the technology. I, th I think people also need trust in the governance of the technology. And this is where this like multi-stakeholder, you know, different governments have to come into play um, because when our world is interconnected and if the U.S. has a certain policy on, let's say, gene editing technology, but China has another, this makes no sense, right? So we've really got to come together and have both trust in the developed metrics for trustworthiness in the tech as well as in the government institutions. Um, so the good news is, is that everyone is talking about this, right? And we're kind of coming, trying to put together principles that will let this happen. So looking forward to unpacking it more. Thank you, uh, Liz. Um, Srikar, you're uh, the last uh, in the row, but not least. Uh, Srikar Reddy, you're the CEO of Sonata Software in India, Bangalore, and as such, um, accelerate the digital transformation of many enterprises uh, with your special uh, platformation methodology. And I think you are also very cru crucial in shaping the digital agenda of many companies. What do you think about how we can move safely forward with the new technologies and actually reap the benefits uh, of them uh, instead of uh, focusing uh, on the negative parts of technology? Yeah, good evening and thank you and uh, great to be here uh, with all of you, uh, with a great, great panel. And I, I think a lot of 
uh, insightful statements have been made by my co-panelists uh, before me. I, I, I think I'd like to just step back. And obviously, I think we're talking about technology. I guess today's topic is more to do with, I think, uh, popularly called digital technologies, because I think that's what have created a lot of damage over the last few years uh, with uh, whatever the fake news and all the other kind of threats and hacking and so on and so forth. Uh, but was, I mean, like the fourth industrial revolution, a whole lot of other developments and other technologies, whether it's biotech, material science, uh, uh, and uh, uh, medical science, and so on and so forth. And I think from the beginning of ma- uh, mankind, humankind, whatever, I think uh, technology has been evol- evolving itself. And I think it overall turned out to be good and uh, not bad for for the uh, world in general kind of stuff. Uh, so... I think end of the day, I mean, uh, technology by itself obviously doesn't do anything. I mean, it's uh, whose hands you put it in and uh, uh, you put it into people with good people with uh, uh, good intentions, good, uh, good thoughts uh, and who generally wish well for the world, for the corporations, etc. And overall, I guess one, one tends to believe or to, to live in this world. One needs to believe that the there are more good people in this world than bad people. Uh, mm-hmm. And... Uh, and so I think, uh, at, uh, you know, and a few. Doing with that for every, I think, one bad use of technology, my belief is there have been 99 good uses of technology. I guess both have to be showcased all the time. Uh, rather than just focus on the bad things, because if we, I mean, obviously, bad news they say makes headlines. Good news nobody bothers about. Uh, but I think overall, I think if you look at it very rationally, realistically, I think uh, uh, even the technologies we are speaking about, uh, the social media or artificial intelligence or whatever it is, kind of stuff has created, I think, more good, more value, more benefits. Uh, better, you know, better everything for people. I mean, I think the amount of power technology has got to deliver services to people, like medical services to people who are far away. controls and you know you can't nobody leaves their house open and goes off in the night anymore kind of thing but you i think you should put whatever controls are needed but create confidence in the overall society about uh, about the uh, the genuine goodness of these technologies create more confidence because end of the end of the day i think that's what i think will make the world a much better place for all of us to live in so I, i'm a uh, eternal optimist and I believe that uh, I think uh, we, uh, there'll be a lot more good than bad. We need to be a little more careful, but I guess uh, we can take good care of ourselves. Okay, if I hear you, um, all four of you, um, then I feel this uh, positive uh, uh, mood about uh, technology, but at the same time, the need to sort of uh, put a red line in the sand and to figure out to where you can uh, can go. And I think, Leticia, in your case, uh, that may be tech diplomacy uh, between countries. In Mohit's case, it may be the charter of ethics. In Liz's case, it may be the scorecard. And Shrikar, if I hear you well, it may be the controls that you that are needed not to leave your um, door open. Maybe it's good if we delve a little bit into what are the elements uh, of uh, establishing how to deal with technology in a safe uh, way. If it's diplomacy or the charter or the scorecard or, or, or controls. Who wants to say something about that? Um, oh, you want to go, Liz? Okay, I'll, I'll go briefly and, and then I guess Liz is going to follow up. <laughs> So I, I want to get back because I think we all yeah, realize the importance of technology to propel us forward, uh, you know, as a global economy, as, you know, the technological progress. And so the key concern, and I think, Annette, you outlined it, is that the trust issue might lead countries 
to erect barriers that would risk paralyzing that global economic growth and stifling that technological progress. So the idea is open versus closed. And so I think when it comes to governments and, and national security, what we're seeing here, the U.S. administration talking about, which I, I feel is, is, is comforting, is building higher walls, but around smaller gardens. So really, and I think this approach can, can work for others, is defining what needs to be protected, protect it better, but leave the rest open so that our businesses, our economy can benefit from uh, you know the the role we all have to play as innovators in the global economy, and I think there are certainly sectors like green tech. We haven't talked about uh, green technology, uh, where an approach that prioritizes climate change uh, really needs to be global. And so, sharing technology, uh, it would seem, and this is my personal opinion, uh, would uh, make a lot of sense uh, if we want to properly address uh, as you know all of us together, climate change uh, as an imperative and <laughs> urgency. Uh, so, so I think really uh, the idea to manage this tricky balance by making sure we spend a lot of time thinking how, how often can we leave world, you know, of course we need to protect some of it, but how often can it remain is, is where we should uh, all focus our efforts. Yeah, I think that's a very uh, positive take eh, that, that you say in principle open, but it cannot be open everywhere. Uh, let's keep the gardens as small as possible uh, when we build a wall uh, and at least address the global issues uh, with tech like green tech uh, where we can together. Liz, um, how is it in your biotech world? Yeah, so... You know, I share, I think, the optimism of the panel here and, and uh, maybe building off of what, Shikar, some of what you said, like, I think tech and especially biotech has the opportunity to de democratize uh, medicine, to close health disparity gaps and even let other areas sort of leapfrog forward. Right. Um, you know, we are putting together this global alliance for diagnostics. And what we're what we're realizing is like, you know, some of the principles and Let's call it pain points and struggles that have happened in the industrialized world. We can skip all that in, in developing countries and just go to, you know, um, solutions that hopefully work. But again, that has to come through stakeholder engagement, you know, taking co con culture into context and dialogue like that. So I'm, I'm pretty bullish about what we can do. And, you know, healthcare, biotech. It's actually quite regulated industry, right? And um, Olaris, what my company does, we develop diagnostic tools to figure out who's going to benefit from a drug and who's not. And when we are pushing these products forward, there are like there are key steps that we have to do that prove our our tech has value, right? And I think that these principles can be applied more broadly. For example, like we have to say, what is our intended use? What is our technology actually designed to do specifically, right? And what is it not designed to do? And how is it used with other potential data sets? And then we have to demonstrate analytical validity that what we're measuring, we are actually measuring clinical validity that like we, you know, it, it matches up with some clinical outcome and utility, right? That this adds value. So like there are examples of, let's say guiding principles for a new technology to emerge in healthcare across diagnostics or therapeutics um, where it's getting a little bit more murky is in like the data lake area, right? Over like electronic health records or just biomedical data, biometric data, like your Fitbit, whatever. And, Cause those ones are a little bit less regulated where tech is still being developed and data is being mined but those things of like intended use analytical validity clinical validity clinical utility aren't necessarily integrated into that and so maybe there's a way that we can take some of those well-established regulatory principles and where appropriate you know apply them to others so that we can you know vet the, the usefulness of, of some of this technology and then you know i think because that tech is so is also slightly different you would have to build on additional layers of, you know, allowing people to opt in and opt out, you know, so that they know how their health data is being collected and being and being utilized. And, you know, I think in the healthcare industry, often we, we have to explicitly state our intended use. But I think what would also be very useful is to start to explicitly state 
like our non-intended use, right? That we, we, we will not use this data for any sort of nefarious, you know, um, results and things like that. And so, you know, I think that there are, there are lessons that we can learn and kind of piece together, you know, not just from healthcare, but from other industries that then again, when put in practice, actually will let other countries, other places kind of move forward at, at an even faster clip. And, and that uh, maybe brings us uh, to you, uh, Mohit, because um, you are obviously uh, putting in a lot of software and all those companies um, collect a lot of data. Um, what is your view on this? Sure. So I think Liz has made an excellent point, right, which is an excellent set of points, actually. The first is about the need to explain what is it that your product is intended to do, what is it not intended to do, what is the thinking behind the intended benefit, and really to explain that to a lay audience fairly clearly. And the lay audience is not just outside the organization, actually it's also within the organization. Large companies have you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And laying out this philosophy of what the technology, the underlying technology is intended to do, I think is, is very, very important. Previously, uh, people obviously have a lot of concerns about how the technology may impact them, right? I think from a uh, one of the key concerns is obviously bias, and this goes towards the provision of government services and the provisions of services more broadly. And the concern, again, is coming from a data perspective because we're using historical data to feed our algorithms. We have to make sure that the uh, nobody is arguing that the algorithms themselves are biased. It is that these algorithms have been built on data sets, and the data sets may have, uh, you know, uh, previous uh, misogyny or racism built into them in terms of credit decisions or in terms of housing decisions. So the issue of uh, bias is an important one to control. Uh, to control for uh, the second issue is around explainability. Uh, we can explain uh, things which are based on decision rules. We denied you credit because your FICO score fell below a certain limit. Mm -hmm. right? But for a lot of the, uh, you know, the latest technology, for a lot of the, uh, well, even actually for biological-based systems, explainability is really not that easy because you really don't know what is going on in the heart of the machine or the heart of the organic machine. So to the degree we can, we should try and uh, address the explainability issue. This medicine gives you a certain benefit because, you know, or if you don't know why it gives you a benefit, we should try and explain that at least in terms of the testing we've done and maybe some population scale metrics. There's the issue of control, right? How do we control things if uh, things go wrong? And there is the issue of privacy, which is, are people really clear about what the, and again, Liz made a reference to this, are we clear about what the data that is being collected is going to be used for? And potentially could it be used against me? You know, could a Fitbit data, for instance, uh, be used uh, against me? You know, if I'm putting in uh, details maybe of, you know, how many alcoholic drinks I'm consuming in a day, could it potentially be used against me by an insurer? Uh, so these are all uh, fairly profound questions, I think, uh, to me, these are the four broad buckets, privacy, explainability, control, uh, and bias uh, that we need to be uh, to be mindful about. And uh, Shrikar, when you hear this, uh, you said uh, 99 out of 100 technologies uh, are uh, for good use or are used uh, well. Um, when, when you focus in uh, on the 1% which uh, might be misuse of technology, um, from your uh, point of view, can you add something on the controls uh, which you think might be interesting to consider? Sure, yeah. I think, again, I think a lot of good points have been made on what, what are the various ways one can put controls in or put, uh, uh, what, 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 what one should look at uh, you know, while using these technologies. So obviously, I think there are controls, frameworks, there are standards, bodies, I think, uh, I, I think there are now standards bodies which have come up for usage of artificial intelligence, uh, you know, and they are disseminated now. So there are macro standards, uh, but finally, I think there also need to be micro standards. That means how do enterprises within themselves uh, set, set standards within their own organization about the use of technology, what it can be used for, what it should not be used for, what are the internal governance mechanisms to ensure there is no misuse of uh, misuse of technology within the corporation. So like you have, uh, I think, corporate governance standards for today for all kinds of things. I mean, I think there are these governance standards which are becoming this thing. And I'm sure they're going to become sooner or later board level issues. If not, if not, they're, if, if, if they're already not uh, like the ESG standards and so on and so forth. So they will become board level issues in terms of 
you know, uh, you know, how are we using technology in our firms? Uh, 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 you know, um, I'm, I'm, there are obviously regulators are going to be breathing down your necks anyway in terms of how you're going, how, how you're doing it, what you're doing it, and so on and so forth. So I think, yeah, I mean, end of the day, I mean, finally, I think there are various methods by which one can implement controls. Uh, obviously, there's no better control than good self-governance uh, mechanisms at the end of the day, I think. Otherwise, you can layer the controls from, uh, you know, countries, global standards, uh, industry bodies, uh, and then come down to the uh, enterprise level and and then see, uh, you know, how do we ensure we put the proper guidelines so that then the people then know that what is the right use of technology and what is the wrong use of technology, what can be used for, not used for, etc. And I guess, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's what I think can lead to, as I said, I mean, 99 applications will be good and one application will be not so good. Annette, can I ask a question? Sure. sure. <laughs> um, actually, it's picking up on something that, that Mohit, that you said, which like I found reassuring. So I think we're living in a world right now that is so data driven, right? I have a T-shirt that says data is the new bacon or data is the currency of the future. And I believe that. Um but what I don't believe is that black box machine learning will answer like all of, you know, the world's questions, especially like in healthcare, because I think physicians, scientists, patients like want to know why. Um, you said that same in, in your industry. And I'm curious if across kind of all the industries that we're working in, if that's kind of a standard that people are working to get, get move away from black box, AI to more white box, clear box, whatever we want to call it. The, the, uh, it's, it's a very good point. The challenge is though that, uh, you know, uh, it is working, right? So even in the healthcare business, if you take it, you know, if you take tumor detection, for instance, right, uh, using neural network, it's very hard to explain why a certain shape or a certain blob was recognized as a tumor, while a certain other shape or blob was not recognized. Right? And the reality is that, you know, we fed 5 million images uh, to a neural network machine and, you know, using a set of weights, it was able to weight the probability that this is the tumor. Uh, I feel that this sort of technology actually will uh, will possibly increase in the future. And it also goes to a human element, right? There's a very interesting uh, paradox, and I've forgotten the name of the paradox, but the paradox is that as humans, we are unable to explain our decisions as well. We come up with a good proxy as an explanation, but truly, yeah. you know, we are not as logical as we may appear to be. Uh, so, it is going to be a challenge because, you know, computing power is, is increasing. The number of nodes in neural networks is increasing dramatically. At the same time, there is a push to, you know, to explain things. But I don't, you know, I doubt if we're going to go back to, you know, complex rule-based systems uh, in the future. Interesting. And I wanted to react briefly myself uh, to what Shrikar uh, mentioned when he brought up ESG standards, because I think it's interesting, it's something I've thought about, that ESG has had a, a key focusing role in the financial industry to really push ESG forward. And similarly, was I think, diversity, you know, all the ratios about, you know, women on boards and in leadership position, you know, it's been really helpful. One thing we, we likely, I think, are going to struggle with and need to be thinking about is in the technology world and uses of technology, what do you measure? It's not as obvious what are the key measures, right? It's about behavior uh, and do you use it properly? And so what measures can we find? Because if we can find good measures, we can in theory include uh, some type of uh, measurements into ESG and expand the pie to say, hey, good use of technology is something we also need to consider. Uh, but yeah, we need to work on the measures. Okay. And I have a question for all of you, because uh, we have a few uh, more minutes uh, to go. Say if we can come up with uh, standards in the world uh, and standards or codes of ethics or however we want to call it for companies and organizations. Do you think that people believe that countries and companies will really adhere to that and comply with that. Do you really think that is the solution to trust? Liz, yeah, maybe, let me take oh, that. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I do believe so, because I think if you see, and I think we're slowly heading it, I'm taking off from the ESG, I think 
there are now uh, 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 the general consumers, investors are also starting to encourage, uh, you know, investing in these kind of uh, companies which are more you know, ethical or ESG oriented and so on and so forth. You know, I was just talking to that day, some somebody the other day about a fairly large Indian company. Uh, and I was why is the stock price so low? He says, I mean, you know, they make you know, cigarettes. So, so that's why, although the profits are very high and they'll continue to grow, uh, uh, the market valuation is not very high. So I think there is now a fairly hidden kind of a thing about people wanting to buy you know, environmentally sustainable products and, and, and all that kind of thing. So I, I do think that while, I mean, companies and governments uh, sh- uh, should behave themselves, but end of the my feeling is, my belief is that end of the day, the market forces and the general world will, will, will ensure that those people who are, those companies, those things which are more ethical, I think, will, will be more encouraged and will be more successful than those who, who are not. That's my belief. So I'm gonna, I mean, I'm torn. I could argue both sides of this. So like are standards enough to like, you know, encourage good behavior? Um, I would hope so, but I'm, I'm not sure. Right. So are there, you know, are there things that you could tie this to like some sort of taxation or penalties or something like that? You know, if you don't adhere to, you know, set set of rules, but I think, as our world becomes more interconnected and maybe consumers like demand, you know, better behaving players, um, you know, and through social media and X, Y, and Z, I I think some of the things that you said, I think, you know, having these standards and then, you know, um, being able to acknowledge the people that are doing it right. And then also call out the people that are doing it wrong, you know, might, might create force that to happen. Yeah, I think if we have the more bright spots, we can shine on companies where they really align their story to their the interest of their consumer. And the more the market realizes this is working for them, the more we might have more companies, you know, that do it and invest in trust building and align them with the, the, all the stakeholders as opposed to, you know, doing things they shouldn't be doing with our data. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think when a company like Glassdoor in the U.S. says, you know, we we won't take down negative reviews of companies uh, because our primary customer is you, the user, and we know you want true data, this is working, right? And so having more uh, of those stories and, and showing the successes of those companies that when you align with, with trust and with your customers, it works. And when you don't, there can be a free fall. So maybe more free I would help more because here is more of a driver, as we know. <laughs> okay. And Mohit? No, I think, uh, look, again, uh, this is probably a complex issue. Uh, I feel like one model that has really worked for the world historically has been the model of the Hippocratic Oath in healthcare, right? It is a very broad oath, uh, but it is used across the world. And you have a broad oath with certain expectations from physicians. And because issues in human health are so complex, you have you know, uh, councils of ethics and of your peers and medical legal professionals who then, you know, pass judgment on what an individual physician may have done. I think we will have to read something similar to this because these are not simple yes or no questions. These have gray areas. But again, in human history, we found a way to resolve these uh, for even very complex issues. And do you all think this is also a matter of um, generations? that young people are more easy to trust technology than older generations. We we have um, a few minutes, so I just want to capture your thoughts very quickly. It's certainly true for now. It's certainly true for now. I mean, you know, uh, we are all talking about data privacy, but, you know, uh, almost everybody, 99.999 people opt in without checking the, uh, you know, what they're signing up to. Uh, But... I think there will be a long-term cost to bear because in the digital world, everything is forever, right? And people should understand okay. that. Liz, what uh, do you think? Um, I, I think it's it's split. Like, I think, you know, I look at some technology um, that, yeah, the older generation just, you know, they don't understand its use or its value or why it would change what was working, right? You know, um, and so there's a, there's a bit of that. But I think the younger generation also knows 
like how, how fast and how easily technology can change. Um, you know, I'm thinking like deep fakes and things like that. And like all of that is becoming sadly like more and more evident in people's lives. And so is that going to lead to a, actually more distrust? I, I don't know yet. Um, you know, again, I think this is probably why we need to set these standards, right? So that we can get, get this in place. And quickly, uh, Letitia, what's your uh, feeling? Um, well, I think the younger generation might be more exposed than we are to the issues, actually. So they, they may be the one that rise up and, and generate this movement within civil society. Because as Mohit pointed, most people, you know, sign and don't check anything of our generation because they haven't paid the cost yet. I mean, not to some extent, but not sufficiently so. I think next generation might be actually not more trustful, but more aware of the mm. Okay, and as last, um, Shrikar, and then we really have to um, finish. Right, it's a very interesting question. I, I don't know whether what the data say, that whether the younger people are more trustworthy and the older people are less less trustworthy. But 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 if that's the trend, then that's good. It's a good trend. I mean, you know, well, <laughs> we need to take a few risks, but uh, hopefully uh, uh, they're, uh, they're trusted more, I think. As we said, I mean, end of the day, I, I think we all have to believe in this and 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 move forward because uh, otherwise we can all be paralyzed by a lot of thinking and uh, very little action. So I think we uh, we need to do that. So so yeah, it's I guess it's all to the good. It's at least a very comforting, I think, for me uh, to hear that people who are working with 